it's a real delight to introduce you to you all, Carol, Carolyn uh, Angleton. And Carolyn, I forget what was your first bio summit, Carolyn, but um, I just want to say, you know, Carolyn has been such an immense leader and, um, and has been a part of the organizing team for at least the past couple of years, but maybe even longer, and uh, has part, been part of the Community Bio Fellowship Program, uh, was one of our inaugural fellows last year, and this year served as a coach. And again, I think, you know, just speaking personally, Carolyn, it's been so awesome seeing your own leadership development and just how you've really just uh, taken hold of uh, bio art and design, working with our organizing team and really crafted so lovingly and attentively, not only this panel, but all of the sessions that are happening later today. So just so, so grateful to you for all of your amazing hard work and leadership. And so everybody, can we all try to do this again? We're going to try to do an unmute thing. You all will be able to unmute yourselves now. And so can we all give some Biosummit love, some snaps, some applause. You can unmute yourself as if you want as well. And welcome Carolyn Angleton. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. That is so wonderful. I'm wondering if we could put a spotlight on the four speakers that will be part of the panel today. That's Eben Kirksky, uh, Dr. Giovanni Aloy, Susan Moenga, and Kathy High. If you can find them in the people and get all four of us up on the screen, that'd be lovely. There, I see Gio Giovanni, Eben. We need Kathy. Hello, Kathy. And we need Susan. Susan Moenga's in, in our group. She's online somewhere. You just have to go through the roll call. All righty, look at you guys. Hello, hello, hello to everybody. I am so glad to have you here. We have people from all over the world, people that have been flying back and forth to get home and, and uh, various things here. So um, thank you, David, for that introduction. It's, it's really been a fantastic thing to work with the Biosummit. And I, I was at the very first one, and I remember hearing about it initially from Patrick at Counterculture Labs, which I would drive three and a half hours to go to meetings there. Um, and he kind of gave me an orientation to what this all was about. And eventually I was able to start up my own thing um, at a community college in Sacramento. So that's where I'm doing my bio art right now. Um, I want to start by thanking the people that have worked on our track. And uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Carolina Sulik, who has been the co-host for this track and has just done wonderful things. If everybody could give a shout out to her, she'll be active later in the track this today. Um, I also want to thank Heidi Jalk for all the work she's done putting the slide decks together. I mean, she has been busting this, this uh, summit to pull it all together with incredible design work, develop some of the posters for this session. Um, I also want to shout out to Roland. I also want to shout out to Alexandra Guinness, who did much of the early design work for the art and design track, really did a beautiful job with that, and many others who will be participating today. So we've already started the bio art track this morning with Roland and he did a start your day with bio art uh, panel. Hopefully some of you were able to come to that. And I just wanna go over a few of the panels that will be happening today. Um, one of the goals of this year's track organizers is to shift our understanding of bio art and design and biomaterials as a field only interested in showcasing advanced artists or hero artists. Uh, we want to shift that to a new definition of art making and look at how we might function as a supportive group of cultural workers, uh, driving questions around biotechnology and organismal ecosystems, and advance bio art as a co-creating process aimed at cultural meaning making. So that's kind of our mission, you know, this, this, um, with what we're doing in this track. Um, and our panels that we have today will reflect that. We'll start out with a panel on co-creating the field of bio art and how to create your own residency, art science residency in local context around the world. And we'll have several of our, a uh, number of our bio fellows from this year's cohort participating in that. Uh, but they'll be followed by a panel on invisible forces with Roland uh, talking about some viral art that he's done, uh, some curriculum development during the pandemic, and then also all things algae by the bio babes. 
So that will be one of our panels. And uh, that will be followed by a panel by Heidi Jalk on prototyping the future of biomaterials. And next, we'll have a wonderful talk by Natsai, a leader in the fashion industry working on sustainable dyeing techniques. Uh, she'll do a talk called The Great Design Rest. And, uh, and then we'll e end up the evening with something called a gratitude offering for organisms that will be done by Jennifer Willett from Incubator Labs. And I wanna remind everybody, um, that's gonna be kind of a group meditation type thing. And we want everybody to bring, to sometime today, find an organism that you can hold by your side during that meditation. So just be thinking about that as we go along. So um, now on to this particular panel that we have here today. Um, I wanna give you a little bit of the context for this panel and some of the ideas that we'll be working with. Uh, this panel is called The State of the Organisms, and it's intended to be a play on the official State of the Union address, and, which is a yearly speech, sometimes a rant, uh, that the head of state gives from the Oval Office uh, to talk about the key issues facing the country and to offer policy-based solutions. I think many of us here today would agree that the who that is considered important enough to include uh, in these talks and in policy priorities is, especially in the United States, reflective of the sole values of the upper class, primarily white, a group of power brokers aimed at how to grow the economy and extract more resources from the earth. That's where I'd say a typical State of the Union would involve. Uh, nowhere in this address do the rights of non-human entities come into serious play. Notably, several countries, including Ecuador, Colombia, and New Zealand initially, have written into their constitutions the idea of nature's right to integral restoration. This is where nature in all of its life forms has a right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital cycles. This is where ecosystems and organisms are actually viewed as living entities with agency, with intricate interwoven properties in which the need for an intact ecosystem, including clean air, clean water, and the right not to be forced to go extinct. Uh, where there's, and this is true whether the entity is a plant, an animal, an algae, or a microism, mi microorganism. These entities have rights to exist. And I think that's, that's, that's mind blowing to think that we have to ask the question, do these organisms have the right not to be forced to go to extinct here? Um, so this is something that is kind of is in the background of what we'll be talking about today. So too, here at the BioSummit, as a group of synthetic biologists and bioartists, we work with these entities. And through the use of their cells, we're now able to change their life trajectories, their metabolic processes, and their integral chemistry. We take for granted the free use of their cells now as another factory-based method of research-focused knowledge attainment and uh, product manufacturing. In this system, in, in this state of the environment, and therefore the state of the organism, we are at this point beyond a tipping point. We have arrived at our future, the one that we've so adamantly engineered by hierarchical and depletionary global and individual practices led by the profiteering and brutal colonial grab of resources, resources by the global north, as well as ourselves as individual people. Seldom do we think of how it is for the other, the non-human, in essence, everything that is more, more or different than the two-legged human. We don't think about how they feel or the senses they have of this moment, 
and that would be by whatever sensory or feeling mechanism they possess. We don't have, we don't need to analyze or to parse out the levels of sentience or award corresponding rights of moral care based on our assignment of sentient level to know that organisms are being dramatically affected at this moment in the crisis, be they large mammals or microscopic entities. So today we have a group of esteemed panelists um, distinguished across the fields of anthropology, multi-species and CRISPR studies, to the field of advanced crop breeding, to an art historian who publishes widely on animal and plant species in the context of art history, and one of the early pioneers in video and multimedia art, media arts, who runs one of the first and only PhD programs for bioartists in the United States. We have quite a group here assembled along this topic, and I'm very grateful to all of you for coming. Um, I would like to introduce first Dr. Eben Kirksky, and maybe you could wave Eben, give us a wave so they know who you are. There's Eben. Uh, he's from Alfred Deakin Institute from Victoria, Australia. Uh, we have Dr. Susan Moenga, if you could wave for us, Susan. Uh, she's from UC Davis Plant Science, and I would, I would still put her halfway between California and Kenya, but in fact, she's actually in Kenya. She just flew back there today, uh, this week, uh, uh, after finishing a PhD program among the smoking fires out in Davis, California. It's, I'm so glad that you could join us, Susan. Uh, we have Dr. Kathy High from Rensselaer Polytech Institute. Give us a wave there, Kathy. She's from Troy, New York. And we have Dr. Giovanni Alloy from the Art Institute of Chicago, um, an art historian from Illinois. So with those introductions, I want to start. And we're going to start with just kind of a general outlaying of each of the panelists' ideas. They'll each have about five minutes to talk about what are some areas of concern that they have. And I'm going to start it out with the question, what is your perception of the state of the organisms currently? And I think, um, Kathy, if you would like to start us out, that would be wonderful. And again, Kathy is running an interdisciplinary art science uh, graduate PhD program at the um, Rensselaer Polytech Institute, a very innovative and historically ground-changing uh, program that she has there. Kathy. Thank you so much, Carolyn. That's amazing. And um, hello, everybody. This is my first bio summit, and I'm super stoked to be here because um, I've wanted to be here for years. And now, even though we're pent up with the pandemic, it has made some things possible. So, and um, today I'm going to just introduce some ideas in response to the wonderful introduction that Carolyn gave. And thank you for organizing this panel, Carolyn. Um, and I, my, my word for the moment we're in would be adaptation and really what we don't know. Um, the concept that I'm going to talk about for a few minutes is ruderal ecologies. Um, and I'm going to borrow from um, Bettina Stotzer, who's a, a SCS person who's been practicing in Berlin. And I want to read a quote from this article she wrote called Ruderal Ecologies, Rethinking Nature, Migration, and the Urban Landscape in Berlin, where she talks about what this means. So Bettina says the, the term ruderal comes from rudus, the Latin term for rubble, a common term in uh, urban ecology. It refers to communities that emerge spontaneously in disturbed environments, usually considered hostile to life. The cracks in the sidewalk, the spaces along the train tracks and roads, industrial sites, waste disposal areas, or rubble fields. Neither wild nor domesticated, ruderal communities depend on what is known as an edge effect and the juxtaposition of contrasting environments in one ecosystem. So you can see this picture I have behind me is a ruderal ecologies landscape from South Troy, New York where I have been practicing and working in collaboration with a friend of mine who's a permaculturalist and, a, and an artist 
Oliver Kellhammer. And we've been looking at these kinds of environments and these are places which have, have uh, gathered a lot of industrial waste. They're sometimes called brown fields where industry has dumped certain kinds of toxins into the, um, or into the ground over time. And one of the things that Oliver and I have been looking at is the way that these um, areas are extremely biodiverse and they're very, um, they're thriving in a lot of different ways. The plants are there and the microorganisms working with them to maybe uh, take up the toxins. And also, you know, there, as I said, there's a huge diversity of uh, plants, animals, and microorganisms that are growing there. I don't think we really know all of the work they're doing. And in fact, most places like cities, uh, not necessarily in Europe, like Berlin would be a great city to look at as an example, not about this, but Troy certainly and other upstate New York cities and cities across the US have been capping their brown fields with asphalt cement and kind of not letting nature per se do its thing. And Oliver always asks, are there novel uh, symbiotic partnerships for bioremediation and detoxification evolving under our very noses? So in thinking about ruderal ecologies, I've also moved into looking at the gut, my own gut biome um, as another kind of environment that I want to investigate. So I've been doing work around the gut biome for a number of years as an artist, not as a scientist, as an artist, but working in tandem with scientists. I have Crohn's disease. So this puts me, uh, which is a, a, a inflammatory disease of the bowel. And um, so I'm interested in this area, probably because of that. But there's been a lot of research around the gut biome of late anyway. The, the one thing that I found about my own gut biome from doing different kinds of testing, particularly with Dr. William DiPaolo in Seattle, he's been a colleague and, and collaborator of mine, is that I have a kind of um, lack of biodiversity in my gut. It's a condition called dysbiosis which is meaning that uh, from treatments I've had with antibiotics and other drug treatments over the years, my gut has sort of lost this wonderful richness of biodiversity. And it, I usually think of this kind of mutation as a kind of negative condition, but lately I've been trying to switch this up to look at these models of ruderal ecologies. And also now I'm looking at other animal models who have conditions of dysbiosis in their gut. And one creature that I found that really lends itself to this are vultures. Um, vultures, the cleanup, you know, animals of the world, the scavengers are really of, of great interest to me because they have a condition in their gut where they have very limited bacteria. They have two bacteria, Clostridia and Fusobacteria, in abundance. Um, and this, I'm giving you a really short, shortened version of what this is, but um, in looking at them, I'm really curious as to how they can tolerate these types of bacteria in this abundance, which would, we wouldn't be able to do, and how it affords them then to clean up sometimes the mess that we leave around, like the dead animals by the road that our cars kill, et cetera, et cetera. So I am trying to figure out if there's any way that I could take my own condition, which is leaning towards this condition of the vulture, and push it a little further that direction. And so I'm thinking about bacteriophages and things that might be able to switch up the profile of the gut. We don't actually know always what's in our gut. Uh, there's still a huge amount of research to do. And I'm hoping that maybe this is work that I can do in the next year with uh, some virologists in Philadelphia at Integral Molecular. So thank you for your time and, and thank you again for listening. Oh my goodness, Kathy, that's amazing. That is so amazing. I'm, I'm such a fan of the work you do and it's so inspiring that as an artist, you're taking on these concepts and, and you're actively, you, you have this element of social activism that is that at the core of your art practice. Uh, thank you very much for sharing thank that with us. Kathy will be talking more on the second panel during our main session. Um, I'd like to move on to Dr. Eben Kursky from Australia and uh, hear what his take is on the state of the organisms right now. How are you doing, Eben? I'm doing great, and uh, it's really awesome to be here and see so many friends in, in this massive Zoom room. 
Um, so there's really one word for me that sums up the state of the organisms, and that is vulnerable. And you know, right now I've been thinking a lot about the human organism. Um, you know, we're we're obviously vulnerable. We're living through a pandemic. Um, but but that that word vulnerable also encapsulates so so much. You know, um, our planetary ecologies are unraveling not only from climate change but from the toxic legacies of industrial capitalism that we're living with. We're living with cancers right now. The the chances are that about half of us on this this panel are going to get cancer. Uh, you know, at some point in, in our lifetime, and in thinking about vulnerability. Um, you know, I, I think it's also important to think about the organism, not just as an entity separate from the environment, but to instead think about the vulnerability of holobionts. So, you know, the holobiont is the organism plus all the others that it depends on. So, you know, for, for us to just care about ourselves in a narrowly construed sense, you know, that's, that's, that's an error. That's an error in thinking, that's an error in ontology. Um, but at the same time, I'm really concerned right now with vulnerable dreams. So I've just finished a book about CRISPR capitalism. It's called The Mutant Project. And it's about um, you know, a, a fragile set of hopes, um, a, a, a group of people, a transnational collective that singled out this one particular receptor called CCR5. You know, let's, let's create a synthetic human organism that isn't uh, going to be vulnerable to AIDS you know, or, or HIV. And you know the, the first people that taught me to hope kind of in this frame of gene editing are, are long-term survivors of, of HIV, people who saw their partners die in the 1980s and the 1990s, um, who've been holding on for their whole lives, like you know, imagining the next experiment as the possibility of a future. And you know, about 10 years ago, some, some of these, these longtime activists got their genes edited. Um, they knocked out CCR5. And um, many of them experience profound health benefits. So people who are able to control their viral loads with regular medicine, many of them um, have damaged immune systems that aren't being uh, you know, taken care of by the current regime of medicine. And, and gene editing provided some fragile hopes for, for these communities. Um, but then CRISPR capitalism or gene editing capitalism got in the way. You know, The company that did this, Sangamo, they made a billion dollars uh, on the stock market. One of them went to jail. One of the Sangamo scientists went to jail for insider trading and the money flitted away towards something else. Um, the book also tells the story of another CCR5 experiment that grabbed headlines, the, the birth of Lulu and Nana um, in the lab of He Zhangkui in uh, Shenzhen, China. And um, you know, there uh, it, it's, it's a similar story. You know, Very fragile hopes of parents who are living with HIV um, who wanted their children uh, to not have that social stigma. HIV in China is, is very much a story of um, you know, a livable disease, but a disease that comes with workplace discrimination, discrimination on the marriage market. So they, they had these fragile hopes for their children bound up in this world first experiment. Um, they can't make babies. If you're HIV positive in China, you can't use basic IVF technologies. So, so, so my book, The Mutant Project, tells their stories. Um, but that particular book and, and my broader work is also all about misplaced concreteness, a sort of genetic fetishism that comes with a lot of this biocapitalist speculation. So these, these dreams about possible futures, synthetic futures for humanity, are focused on these little genes that you, know, you can toggle one way or the other way, and it's kind of ambivalent. You know? Knock out CCR5, yeah, okay, you might not be vulnerable to HIV infections, at least most strains of HIV infections, but you're more vulnerable to a pandemic flu. Um, so CCR5, it turns out, is, is um, really important if you're worried about getting avian influenza. So you know, now living in a pandemic, it's easier to appreciate. You know, in 2018, when Lulu and Nana captured international headlines, um, you know, there's there's debate like, oh, maybe it is worth it. You know, let's let's get rid of CCR5. Who cares if you you know avian? That's don't worry about pandemics. But you know, it's that logic of misplaced concreteness that I think, you know, if we're just focusing on the human, um, that's an error. So, 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 so the book also explores possible multi-species futures for the human, the human becoming other, the human becoming, you know, what if we think with Octavia Butler to think about the sorts of hybrid multi-species futures that we might inhabit, you know, if the current moment is about a collective planetary vulnerability where 
you know, we are depending on these commodity chains. We are depending on, you know, all sorts of industrial assemblages that are generating the cancers in us that now need the biotech cure. What if we were to live and die otherwise? What if we were to imagine a post-human future that is about, you know, um, reconfiguring our basic biology that does things different and, and doing so in a humble way, right? So, you know, these, these babies, one of the things I reveal in the book uh, that, that hasn't been published before is that the babies were ill at birth. And, um, you know, I, I think again, that misplaced concreteness, locating a solution in a gene is a mistake and we've got to think about the whole of bio. That is an incredible run through of a very, very complex set of uh, issues there. And you have done some fundamental ground groundbreaking work in your recent book just on these issues. And I also want to mention that even ran a coronavirus multi-species reading group throughout the early parts, or I, you're still doing it, I believe. Um, I, I went to some of the earlier ones. Um, that was just phenomenal in terms of the number of spe uh, speakers he brought in there and just the perspectives of looking at this from multi-species issues. So thank you so much for your work even of bringing people together and also just the intensity of your intellectual pursuit. Uh, I really appreciate it. Yeah. I'd like to go next to Dr. Susan Moenga from Kenya. Um, again, she's, she's just flown back from Kenya. We, uh, we were talking back and forth about, she lives about an hour from where I do in California, and she was right at the heart of the huge fire that came to the edges of Solano County. And um, in the midst of all of this, you were cranking away finishing your PhD, and you are also one of the bio fellows in, the, in my pod group, which I so appreciated your contributions to that. So could you give us your take on what the state of the organisms is right now, Susan? Thanks, Caroline. It really is an honor to be part of this meeting. It's my first bio summit. I'm very excited to meet you uh, and learn so much from it everyone and this is such an eminent panel I am there to be part of it um, my internet is a bit shaky because I'm still trying to figure out the best ISP I just got home a couple of days ago so I'm sorry if I you know disappear during my conversation um, I'll try to get back as soon as possible um, so I have spent quite some time working with a, a, a species a, a crop species a plant species that a number of people in this group would actually um, be familiar with but in a different setting that wouldn't probably be the case I, I've been working with chickpeas the bands of beans for some people um, and I, I think that one of the most interesting things that came out last year there was this article from the Atlantic that said everything in the future will be made from chickpeas and I thought it was such an overstatement, and I'm very biased to, towards chickpeas, as you can imagine. Um, and one of the things that really made me think about this article um, is that there is over a billion people that have been depending on chickpea as a primary source of protein. So in countries like Ethiopia, in Niger, in India, in Pakistan, it is the most important uh, source of protein. Now, the West, on the other hand, um, chickpea has had a slow entry into the market. Meat has always been marketed as the primary source of protein. I think that uh, places like the U.S., people talk about beans and peas and you know, chickpeas and, 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 and lentil as a source of protein um, until quite recently when there's been a, a huge shift to plant-based uh, proteins and, and plant-based uh, meat. Uh, if you may, and I say that, uh, quote, unquote. Uh, now, once the West started shifting um, this sort of uh, fad or trend to plant-based uh, diets, then crops that have been so important in other cultures uh, all of a sudden gained so much significance. So there's a constellation of companies that have taken off in the last, you know, seven to 10 years, you know, based on this, what we would otherwise consider really, really small um, uh, components of the, you know, the, the crop market share, if you may, um, at least in the West. So the, the few words that come to me when I think about the state of the organism is ignored and marginalized. 
And so this, uh, when I think about chickpea, and it, it's, that's just an example, um, which is this, it, it's a massively important crop. When you go to places like India, there are farmers who depend on it for not just um, income, it, not just the nutrition, but chickpea belongs to a group of um, crops that we call legumes, and it's an even smaller group of, of those legumes is the pulse legumes. Um, again, really, really small fraction of the food that we consume today. And to give you a little bit of context, um, in, 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 in modern society, there's about 7,000 plants that we think of or we call food. Now, out of that 7,000, there's only about 20 that we depend on for caloric content. So what happened to the 6,980? Um, and out of that, even 20, corn, wheat, and rice make up 60% of our caloric source. It's staggering how we have, you know, we have sort of hierarchicalized, that's not a word, but there's a tier of importance of these crops. And I mean, obviously, the historical perspective is why that is. But the question is, have we perhaps made a mistake? in the face of climate change, in, in the face of um, a time that we really deeply think about diversity in every sense from you know, human interaction to the kind of foods that we eat, you know, our nutritional profile, the kind of diversity on your dinner plate. Uh, perhaps this reductionist approach in choosing our foods and, and um, sort of uh, pyramidizing them uh, may not have served us right. Could we go back and relearn some of the things that we lost? And so I've spent some time really thinking about chickpea and thinking about chickpea as a model for some of these crops that we today, for a lot of our cultures, we consider often crops, but they are so, so important. The nutritional profiles are massive. This legumes, for instance, we think of them as, as, as fertilizer factories for the soil. Um, I really appreciated what Kathy said about the microbiome. So for people, I mean, this is huge. We discovered that for all the things that we've been adding to the soil, for whether it's to enhance or to deal with disease um, or, you know, herbs and um, sorry, um, weeds and, um, and, and perhaps pests, uh, perhaps they've been reducing the diversity of microbes and fungi in the soil that have been mutually associating with plants, you know, to, to benefit um, these plants. And chickpea is one of those crops that you really gives us a sense of perhaps where we could have we may have gone wrong in this pipeline of developing a minute group of uh, crops that we value today. Susan, all of those things are just so pertinent in terms of what you're talking about and um, you know some of the conversations that we had in talking about this is that you've been going to graduate school at a very advanced one of the most advanced plant scientists uh, plant science places at uc davis and um, one of the things that you emphasized uh, i asked you you know are, are you using crispr or are you using tumefaciens to breed plants and you talked very specifically about that you're using traditional breeding methods in order to get these plants into the food system and usable. And so I think that is important for the people working in biotechnology to hear in terms of what's the nature of breeding techniques that somebody like Susan is learning and, and utilizing in order to take it back to real world situations. So thank you so much for that information. I think the, the politics of what we grow and, and uh, who determines that are critical and they are very much so in the nature of how we create. What are we creation, creating? What is the proce process of creation, uh, whether it be traditional art or whether it be engineering our futures? So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to go now to our final pan panelist who is Dr. Giovanni Alloy from the school at the Art Institute of Chicago. He has done phenomenal work uh, running an online journal, Antennae, and uh, gives numerous talks and does research both on the, the state of the animal as well as the state of plants. So thank you so much for joining us and welcome. What's, what's your take on the state of the organisms, Gianni? Giovanni? Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I knew this panel was gonna be amazing. I know the panelists and I know what they're capable of and I'm just so excited to hear what they've got planned for us. Um, I think 
the organism is really, really tired of our obsession with purity. And that's a kind of bottom line, if you like, an undercurrent to um, everything I have done over the past uh, 10 years. But in a nutshell, my work is concerned with representation on multiple levels. Uh, I studied visual cultures as well as art history, you know, in, uh, in Italy. And I am very painfully aware of the importance of representation in art and how art then influences everything else we consume um, just in visual cultures, thinking about movies, advertising, it's everywhere. The tropes that were set uh, for the representation of animals and plants uh, during the Renaissance as well as uh, our colonial heritage still pervade the representational tropes of today in very subliminal ways. So a lot of my research has uh, looked at the root of the problem within the context and broader focus of engagement. Everything I do is designed to uh, evidence and highlight certain structural um, paradigms that define our relationship with nature that prevents us from understanding nature from different perspectives and try to undo, try to disentangle those uh, paradigms so that we could see beyond the strictures of representations. And I'm thinking specifically when it comes to art, our obsession with symbolism and the representation of nature that has uh, objectified organisms over time. I'm thinking specifically, just one example uh, among many, the representation of flowers and still life painting during the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, the idea that contemporary artists artists working in bio art today are actively pushing against those paradigms because they're very aware of the roadblocks. These very simple, very poetic and romanticized relationships with the non-human have actually created over time. So over the past 20 years, I've focused on animals at the beginning with the field of animal studies and um, around 10 years ago, shifted to plants uh, within the holistic conception of the Anthropocene. And one of the ideas that I hope to be able to explore today is related to two of my recent books. One, it's called Speculative Taxidermy, and the other one, uh, Why Look at Plants. In both books, in different ways, I focus on the um, manipulation of uh, organisms, the discourses between um, humans, artists, organisms that happen in art today as a collaborative process, worrying a lot about the ethical implications uh, entailed by what I call provocatively a collaborative process, worrying a lot about objectification and also focusing on the potentiality for engagement. That's one of the things uh, I am really fond of when uh, it comes to bio art, when we think about bio art. So the ability to break the mold, the ability to leave behind traditional tropes and think at the speculative edge of philosophy. So I have focused a lot on concepts of domestication and biopolitics, how animals and plants are never truly passive in these discourses, how they can draw the line at our desire, at what we want to accomplish. But also, more recently, um, I think I had the opportunity because of the general discourses, the tensions around race, gender, uh, and immigration have also led me to focus more intensely on discourses of nativism. So native species uh, vs cultivars in the case of plants more specifically, and the actual benefits to ecosystems. So that to me remains the paramount concern about the state of the organism. I see the organism as defined by tensions, limits, and becomings that are human non-human becomings. Uh, human non-human becomings dictated and defined by capitalism, by history, by the way in which we are unable to think beyond the cultural structures that we have created, ultimately with the goal of sustainability at the very end of it all. 
um, our obsession with purity just returning to that point is one of the roadblocks that we still carry with us, especially in the conception of nativism, uh, decolonization, and all the hot topics related to sustainability that we are engaging with today. That's incredible. You covered so much and you have some very interesting takes on the notion of nativism versus the right of a plant to remain where it's been planted uh, by a person. I'm going to where we have three minutes late and I'm going to pull a question that I see from Marilla uh, Costa from Brazil and she's asking you Giovanni are flowers, plants, and animals made as symbols with wrong messages attached? She, she wants some clarification on that. Did you say, oh, wrong, I see the message. Yes. It's not a matter of right or wrong, uh, as far as I'm concerned. It's a matter of anthropomorphism and symbolism, diverting our attention from the organism to something human again. So symbolism working as a reflection of ourselves that hollows the organism, the organism to become a, a sort of ventriloquizing tool, a kind of a, if you like, a straw to blow into so that we could just access ourselves once again. All right, that, yeah, that, that's a beautiful answer. And I think that is in fact kind of a metaphor to how we are interacting with most organisms at this point, that they are a, a straw to blow in. I love that term or uh, something for us to manipulate. And uh, so we're at the end of the, our time, but we will continue to look at these issues about how organisms exist on the, the spectral edges of human beings, uh, what we're doing to the world. And it's, um, it's a concern for all of us in many fields and particularly in the arts uh, and in the humanities, this is an issue that has come to a critical mass, a critical time to explore this. So I thank all of you. Thank you so much to our panelists. If we could give them a big round of, of snaps uh, to thank all of our panelists here and stay tuned for more. We're gonna go into these concepts in depth in the first panel in the, uh, bio art and design track today starting at two o'clock thank you so much everybody yay thank you carolyn can we keep the the claps and the snaps going for uh for all of our presenters our panelists and for carolyn and um somebody remind me which which uh organ which room are you guys in for the afternoon for bio art design somebody has to tell me i don't have it right in front of me or we can put it in the chat so everybody reminds remembers all right the golgi we're getting hit with lots of golgi complexes great Golgi Complex at 2 p.m. Eastern. Looking forward for a, to a, an epic five hours of bio art and design. It, it's a really amazing lineup. I think the, uh, the organizers have really just done an incredible job, very thoughtfully curating the afternoon. So really enjoy it. <laughs>